Thank you so much for taking the time out of your days, your evenings, whatever time it is, wherever in the world you are joining us from to be able to join us for the Spinning Your Web Application Workshop. Uh, this is part of a series of events. So um, you've clearly found the registration for tonight's program, but if you'd like to continue to tune in throughout the autumn and be able to engage further in learning about both the University of Richmond as well as the application process, we really encourage you to join us for our future Spinning Your Web events. But tonight's program is going to specifically focus on the application process, both at the University of Richmond as well as in general. What we're hoping to share is some direct insights um, from the perspective of admission officers who read thousands of applications each year. Um, and we hope that this is a great time for you to be able to get your questions answered. Um, we do have the Q&A enabled. Um, I will say we will be covering a lot of information tonight. So um, chances are we will probably get to something that is on your mind if you want to hold on a few of those questions, but certainly feel free to use that space to be able to engage with us. And we will have some time after our formal presentation to be able to um, get to some of the things that might be on your mind. Um, but we'll begin with just some brief introductions. So uh, my name is Beth Ann Spate. I am an Associate Director of Admission at the University of Richmond. Um, I have been working for um, over a decade in college admission, have certainly um, developed some tips and tricks that I love sharing with students. And so I was excited to have the opportunity to engage with you this evening to be able to share some of those firsthand insights. And I'm joined, of course, by um, my wonderful colleague, Lauren, who I will let introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Bennett. I'm a senior assistant director in the office. I've been at the University of Richmond going into my sixth year, um, but I've been in admission for about eight years. So um, also I've read lots of applications and excited to talk with you all tonight um, and hopefully give you some tips as you're starting this application process. Awesome. So our goal is to really peel back the curtain this evening um, and give you some some candid viewpoints. Um, so I think that's the commitment we'll make to you is that uh, we will keep this pretty conversational and um, definitely uh, hope that is helpful to you. So we'll dive right in. Yes, so at the University of Richmond, we accept two different types of applications. We accept the common application and the coalition application. We have no preference in which one you use. So if you're applying to multiple schools through the common application, great, feel free to add it on. Um, add us onto that list because it looks the same on our end. Um, the common application and coalition application are universal applications so that you're entering basic information like your biographical information, some of the classes you're taking, your extracurriculars, and you're only needing to do that one time. So you're not having to type it in for every single school you're applying for. So hopefully it makes it a little bit easier when you are applying to schools. Some schools also have institutional or statewide um, applications, but at Richmond, we're just accepting the common application and the coalition application. When we receive your application, there are different things that we're looking at, which you can see on your right-hand side of the application component. So we get some general information about you and your family, as well as the classes that you're taking in your senior year. We receive your transcript from your school, um, which we'll dive in and talk a little bit about and how we review that, um, your extracurriculars, different essays. So within the Common App and Coalition App, there is a personal essay. We'll also talk a little bit more about that, um, but it's a nice way for you to kind of have a conversation with us, tell us your story. And then we do have an additional required essay. We call it the Richmond Question. Three topics you can choose from, but just additional ways for us to get to know you as a student and as a person because we review applications holistically. So for any seniors in the room, um, I'm sure you've heard that term many times before. So what does holistic mean? Um, so at Richmond um, and most places, um, holistic means that we are looking at the whole applicant, the whole application. So there are kind of two buckets that a lot of the information kind of falls in, the academics as well as the personal side of the application. So at Richmond, we're really diving in for the academics since we are a highly selective institution. We wanna make sure that the students we are admitting will be academically successful. 
upon their time here at Richmond, but we also are taking into account that personal side of the application, the things that you're spending your time doing, what are your passions, what are your interests, because we want students who are gonna come on our campus, make a difference, make a change, make us better, because we're always looking to improve. Um, we really want students that are gonna come on our campus and be engaged in our local community or in our campus community and the application through your extracurriculars, your essays, your letters of recommendation, those are ways that we're really gauging um, who you are as a person. And of course, it's about the consistency across all of those factors that Lauren uh, mentioned. And so what we're really looking to identify as we engage with your application are some of the emerging themes. Sometimes, um, and I'd say oftentimes, where we're spending a lot of our efforts are analyzing your transcript and really taking a look at how you chose to progress through your high school curriculum in the context of what was available to you at your specific high school. We do recalculate GPAs at the University of Richmond, and the way that we do that is by taking a look at your core subjects, which are of course listed right here. And so what we hope that students have done is really focused on a strong core curriculum that is broadly scoped across disciplines, because we believe that it really will be aligned with the type of academic experience that we offer at the University of Richmond to be a very interdisciplinary thinker. Um, if you're a biology major, you still need to be able to write effective lab reports, right? Um, and so um, really being able to have a strength across skill sets is what we hope to see. Um, now, of course, we also see um, that students, uh, we hope, are pursuing personal interest over the course of pursuing a rigorous uh, high school curriculum. So sometimes that might look like um, doubling up in um, the humanities because of a potential interest in ultimately majoring in that discipline, or it might mean um, you know, being very intentional with the classes in which you pursue college level or upper level um, subjects. We are very aware at the university that not every school offers the same types of off, uh, program offerings. So we do not hold that against you. Um, and I always tell students that we are really looking to see that you have maximized the available curriculum to be a competitive student at the University of Richmond. Um, and so context really is key. Um, because you do not apply directly into a particular program of study at the University of Richmond, so you're not applying directly into a school or directly into a major, there are not necessarily particular classes that we expect you have already completed in order to be eligible for access to a certain major at the University of Richmond. That being said, we do have a set of minimum admission requirements and the strongest students in our applicant pool are going to be able to take a varied course load that really does maximize these course subjects each of their four years. So you might be wondering, um, that's great, you talk about context, but how do you actually get that context? So you may or not know this, um, but when your transcript arrives at our desks, it comes accompanied by a document called a school profile or a school report. And this is a detail of um, all of the things that your school thinks is imperative for us to know to be able to understand the offerings the um, progression and the credentials at your particular school. This is where we can quickly and easily identify, for example, in a transcript, when we see 500 for a, particular, for a certain school, it might mean that that is automatically a college level course. Um, and so there are these little nuances that we really get to know, and we really do rest upon the school profile that accompanies the transcript to be able to help us understand the context of the class. And so we're really looking to see that you have not only challenged yourself, but challenged yourself and performed strongly in relation to the peer set around you. Um, so that is definitely a space where, again, we spend a lot of our time and we also get a lot of our insights directly from your school to come from an informed place when we are analyzing that transcript. <clears throat> um, you will definitely find um, that uh, this is something you can actually ask your school if they have, um, particularly domestic students um, who are in the room today. Um, almost all U.S. Uh, high schools will have some form of a school report. Um, so if you're ever curious, that is something you can often ask for as well. So kind of going back to that holistic admission, when we're looking at the academic bucket, um, aside from the transcript, another portion that we're looking at is standardized testing. Now for this year, for our seniors in the room, we are test optional again. For any juniors that are in the room, um, Richmond 
like to do it year by year. So we don't have a decision quite yet. Um, but if you are a senior and you're applying to Richmond, we are test optional both for admission and for merit aid. So that's really important as you're looking at schools to see if test scores are required to be considered for merit aid, which at Richmond, they are not. Um, when you are looking at a school and trying to decide if you want to apply test optional or submit your testing, some general pieces of advice would be to look at the school's um, student profile, look at that middle 50% for the accepted students. And if you fall within that, maybe think about submitting. You can kind of use your best judgment. Um, if you fall above that middle 50%, probably think about submitting. Um, and if you fall below it, maybe think about um, being test optional. The choice is truly up to you. We want you to think about is the test score a component of your academic ability that you think is important for us to see? Um, is it accompanying to your transcript or is it something that maybe you feel your transcript explains your academic ability a little bit better? So it truly is up to you and if you want to be test optional. If you apply test optional, please know that it does not look negative. We do not look at that negatively. Um, we do not know if you've ever taken the test. We don't assume that you've taken it and done poorly. We don't have the time to look up and see if you've ever taken the test. Um, I'm sure Bethann is with me and wishing that we had that time, um, but we don't. Um, so we will just use your transcript and that school profile, really placing a lot of emphasis on the grades and the classes that you're taking and just use that when we're assessing your academic ability. Absolutely. And I think it's it's always funny to me. I think one of the questions I get asked most often is, can you tell me if I should send it or not? And unfortunately, it is not a decision that we can make on your behalf. Um, my, my rule of thumb, I think, is when in doubt, do without, because that's often perhaps a signal to yourself that in your gut reaction, um, maybe testing is not as reflective of my abilities or what they will see in my day-to-day -day landscape um, than I would hope for it to be. And again, as Lauren said, we're not second guessing your motives. Um, so it, it truly, we're not putting that degree of thought into why you did or did not. Um, so um, definitely don't let this stress you out too much. Yeah. Take advantage of it. Um, another one of the spaces that we really get to hear your story is by reading the insights of people who know you well. And so the letter of recommendation for those of you who might be underclassmen or juniors in this room, um, this is a great time to start thinking about who might I want to write my letters of recommendation down the road, because you have plenty of time to be able to um, really make sure that they know you on a personal level. Um, seniors, hopefully you've been doing that all along, but what you really wanna be concentrating on is who knows you from a variety of perspectives. So we do require at least one letter of recommendation to come from a school official. That may be a counseling office. Um, I know we have a lot of international students in this room who might be saying, you know, I don't have a US university counselor and that's okay. Um, we do, do need to have it come from though, a school, uh, a school individual or someone who can speak to you in an academic context. We do offer you the opportunity to send up to two additional letters of recommendation, but it is not a requirement, nor is it going to be something that uh, notches you into a superior context uh, in our review process if you have more letters of recommendation. Um, so really think intentionally about who knows me um, and who knows who will share something slightly different about my story than maybe has been read um, in another space. Ideally, when we're moving through the application with each new page we get to, it is another opportunity for us to peel back a layer of who you are and what you would add to or bring to our community. And so it is an exciting opportunity for us um, to be able to, to get that firsthand perspective. Um, I often get asked, you know, I have a religious leader, I have a coach um, who knows me very well, may I send that as my letter of recommendation? And yes, you can, but it also needs to accompany, again, that academic perspective. Um, so as long as you have that on file, um, that is something that is important um, to be able to uh, consider in the scope of who you are going to be asking to write your letters of recommendation as well. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is that, um, a lot of times, you know, the strongest letters of recommendation may not actually be from the class where you did the best. Um, a lot of times, uh, it might be a class that you may not have performed to the best of your ability at the start, but you worked extremely hard or you really collaborated directly uh, by seeking out the guidance of that teacher. And in that process, they really got to see your gumption. They got to see your hard work. 
And sometimes that's a very valuable perspective for us to see of how resilient you would be on our college campus when you encounter obstacles. So the choice is yours in terms of who you ask. Um, but again, think broadly about who those people might be. Another piece of your application, um, and this is part of that common application or coalition application, it gives you 10 slots to list different activities that you're doing um, that can be in your high school or outside of your high school. So we just want to get to know you a little bit better and what are you spending your time doing? Um, this helps us get a little bit more insight into your passions and your interests. At Richmond, um, we are a school of 3,200 students and we have close to 180 clubs and organizations. So that's a lot of organizations for the size of our school. So we really want students who are gonna come on our campus and be really engaged and involved in things. We know you'll probably be involved in different things when you come to college and that's okay. Um, but the extracurricular activities and your resume really help us get to know you a little bit better. Don't feel that you need to have something for every 10 slots. Some students have three or four that are really meaningful, impactful things that they're involved with. Maybe they've been involved in the same organization since um, ninth grade, and they now hold leadership positions. That longevity and leadership are really great things that we love to see. Make sure whenever you are listing out what your involvement is or what the club might be, take into consideration that we don't go to your high school. So if your extracurricular activity has an acronym or a special position that isn't very intuitive to us, be sure to spell that out or let us know what you're doing um, within that club so that we can fully understand your commitment. It also doesn't have to be formal leadership positions. So maybe you took it upon yourself to host the blood drive for Key Club or to design the t-shirt that your club's going to sell. Um, anything that you're doing that's kind of going above and beyond, feel free to list that out in the explanation of the activity because we love to know more about you and your passions throughout those different activities. This can also be things that you're doing outside of your school. So while you might be involved in the marching band and soccer or key club, um, you might be involved in things outside of your high school as well. And we wanna know about that. So maybe you're involved in your church or a local um, community-based organization where you're doing some community service, you have a part-time job. Maybe you have to go home right after school because your parents work late and you're the person in charge of picking up your siblings, making dinner and make sure that all the homework gets done. Those are things we want to know about. Again, we just want to know how you're spending your time. Um, if you feel that you have a lot of things you want to let us know that you're doing, you can also submit a resume through your spider portal once you apply to Richmond, um, but it's not required. Those 10 spots kind of pick which ones your top um, favorite ones are. I think it's nice to kind of order them in importance to you. That helps us kind of get to know what your true passions are when we're reviewing your app. Absolutely. And I just want to echo that last point. I I really think it's important to emphasize that a good resume does not have to mean that you have taken up all 10 spots. Mm -hmm. Usually, because I'm hoping that students have done just what Lauren said, listing things in order of personal importance, not necessarily what they think is going to sound most impressive to us. Um, I'm often looking to the first three to five activities on a resume to get the most firm snapshot of what a student is um, really caring about. Um, so definitely um, really resonates with me, Lauren, everything that you just shared. Right, and then of course, the college essay. Um, now we know that this is one of the most stress inducing places or parts of the application process and um, it really shouldn't be. Um, we hope that the college essay is really just an opportunity to round out the picture that we have already been able to get a sense of from the other components of your application. It is the one opportunity where you can show a little bit of your personality because it is the only portion of the application where we hear your voice directly. Now, in that, I think that there's a lot of pressure that students place upon themselves to come up with the most unique topic, the thing we have never read before, the thing that we will remember for 10 years to come. And that is an unreasonable expectation to put onto yourself. I'll just put it out there. I can read 10, 15, 20 essays on a very similar topic. In fact, we are asking you to respond to roughly the same prompts. Um, and so inevitably that will happen, but it's about how you really vocalize that experience, how you share your viewpoint on the world, how you um, really uh, could, could show who you would be on our campus that matters to us. And I think the best piece of advice that I can give you on that is that um, you want to 
kind of start small and not try to do too much. Um, I find that the essays that try to tackle the biggest topics in 650 words are the ones that struggle with clarity. Um, so think about a moment in time, a snapshot, an illustration, a small example that can really tell us who you are and a little bit more about yourself. And I can't say this enough, so I'm gonna say it once more. It is not the topic itself that matters. It is how you write and what you reveal about yourself. Ultimately, what are we looking to gain from the uh, application essay? We're hoping to see that you can put together a well-constructed, grammatically sound piece of writing that would translate seamlessly into a college environment where you will be asked to do just that. And we're hoping again that we learned something new about you that we had not learned before, or we reinforced something that we had seen in your application, but got to hear a little bit more about it in depth. If you are still stressed out about finding the topic, um, there's a really wonderful resource that I always like to share with students. Um, it's from a book called Write Your Way In by Rachel Tour. And she recommends putting yourself on a timer. For the sake of this, I'll say no more than five minutes and write a list of the first 15 topics that come into your mind and do not censor yourself. And her argument is basically that the first one to five are going to be very surface level, perhaps a little bit more obvious topics. I love community service and helping the people around me. Once you get a little bit deeper into that list, that's where some of the more quirky elements start to come to life about you or, or how you are in the world. She gives the example deep down in her list of, I always lose my keys. Well, what does that teach about you? That could teach you know that you're constantly um, making mental lists. You're very aware of your surroundings. You're good at problem solving because you have to find your way out of that scenario, um, right? So these small moments can be just as compelling for a college essay as some of those bigger or um, more compelling, um, or students think they are more compelling topics. Uh, last thing I'll say is you do not have to have suffer suffered a major tragedy in your life to uh, create a compelling college essay. Um, we do not expect that you have found the cure to cancer at the age of 17. Um, we, we want you to sound like a high school student in your own voice. Um, and so um, definitely authenticity is, is the main thing that we're hoping to gather from this space. And we hope that you are excited about the opportunity to share that with us. So as I mentioned earlier, um, in addition to the personal essay, which I think gave some really great advice on, um, we also have an additional required essay. So some schools might have optional additional supplemental essays, um, but at Richmond, we call it the Richmond question. Um, it is a required essay for you to write. Um, and there are three different prompts that you can choose from. We're very excited. These are new to us this year. Um, so as Bethany mentioned before, we read thousands of applications. So reading thousands of applications on the same three topics multiple years in a row, um, we are very excited to switch it up. There is no hidden agenda or message behind which topic you choose, which everyone speaks to you and you feel can highlight an importance or um, passion or an interest or one that you just feel like, oh, okay, I think I have something to write this one on. Um, great, go for it. There is truly no right or wrong topic to choose. We just, again, want to hear from you. This doesn't need to be a novel. Um, maybe a few more than like a couple sentences um, is great um, because we do have such limited pieces of your application to get to know you and to get to um, see, envision if you would be a great student for Richmond and if Richmond would be an institution for you because we're looking for the fit both ways. Um, so definitely take some time to think about the Richmond question but again, being really genuine to yourself for both the personal essay and the Richmond question. If you're not a poet, don't feel like you need to write a poem. If you're not funny, don't feel like you need to be funny for your essay. We really just want to hear your genuine, authentic self. Um, there is no like special formula that we are looking for for an essay. We just really want to hear from you and what really speaks to you in your, what you want us to know about. Um, if you're looking for a good measure to test the essay out on, find a trusted friend or someone who knows you and your voice quite well and give them your essay to read. And this sounds like a weird tip, but ask them to summarize it for you in a sentence. 
And hear that sentence back. And if you feel like, okay, that's what I was trying to get across, then that's a really good sign that your clarity is there and that the takeaway is sound. If they're really struggling to come up with a sentence that summarizes your essay, that's probably a sign that you need to go back and work on it a little bit more. And why do I say a sentence? It's because when we are reading your application essays, again, we have a great volume that we're working through. Um, we are generally summarizing your essay and our takeaway from it in about a sentence to be able to share with our colleagues on the admission committee who will ultimately be making the decisions on who is admitted. Uh, Lauren and I have served on the, the same admission committee for many years at this point. Um, and it's a really great way for us to be able to, again, um, have different perspectives on the same student um, and kind of come to a consensus from there. But the one sentence test can be a really good one wow. to put your essay through um, to be able to, to really see if that, that clarity is there. That's a great piece of advice because there are many times that we'll read an essay like two or three times and I'm like, I don't really know what the student's trying to tell me. Um, so I like that one sentence rule. Yeah. All right, so of course, the last decision you have to make in your application process, uh, other than where will I actually attend, um, hopefully when good news comes your way, um, is how do I apply? Now, we do have a number of different application plan options. And so there are a lot of ways that you can get your application our way. We operate on the ones to keep it a little bit simple to make sure that you can keep track of these dates and deadlines. Um, now we offer early decision, which is a contractually binding agreement. If you are accepted early decision, you are going to be attending the University of Richmond and withdrawing all your applications from all your other schools to enroll. It's a big decision. And for that reason, in part, we offer two potential ways to apply early decision. We have an earlier date and a later date. There is no difference in how we review applications between early decision one and early decision two. You are still signing a contract basically um, that is saying, again, I will attend if I am accepted. Um, but a reason why a student might choose the later deadline is simply, you know, I need a little bit more time to determine if Richmond is where I can see myself. Perhaps you haven't taken standardized testing and you wanted to just see what happens um, in that, or perhaps you have taken it, but you want to see what your super score would be. I don't think we mentioned this, but um, we will take the highest across your trials of the exam if you have taken a standardized test more than once to become your score. So just a side note on that. Um, and then lastly, we might find that a student, you know, had a shaky start to their last year in high school, and they really want to have a more robust set of senior year grades available for the admission committee to view before we're rendering a decision. Um, so those are the reasons typically that we'll see a student choose for that later deadline. Um, but in terms of, again, the, the agreement is still the same, um, and um, you still find out your admission decision a little bit earlier. So that's good news. Um, now, if neither of those are for you, early action, I sometimes call the Goldilocks admission plan because you still find out your admission decision a smidge earlier, but you're not bound to the agreement. Um, if you apply early action um, November 1st, you will typically find out your admission decision around mid-January, but you still have until May 1st to ultimately decide if you would like to attend, if you had been accepted. The other reason why that's nice is because you have automatically met our scholarship deadline. So this is a little confusing because there is no separate application to be considered for scholarships. There's no separate process, just your regular application for admission submitted by the date of December 1st will automatically put you in consideration for every merit scholarship opportunity that we have. So even if you are applying by our latest application plan of regular decision, you still wanna click the submit button if you are able by December 1st to throw your name in the hat for consideration. Now, if you miss that deadline, yes, there is still another scholarship. We call it our presidential scholarship that you would be considered for. That is valued at one third tuition and the Richmond Scholars Program is valued at full tuition plus housing and food. And so um, it is our most competitive scholarship. Uh, only about 25 students are awarded that particular opportunity in our class, um, but there is nothing to lose by throwing your name in the hat and just making sure that you have met that deadline. So that's how we operate. Um, one thing to be aware of um, is that we do have a little bit of a grace period with each of these deadlines, we call it a credentials deadline. You will see this if you go to our admission website. And what that means is that you still need to have clicked submit 
to meet your date. Um, but if you need a little bit of extra time to get supporting materials on file, there is a bit of a grace period after the deadline, um, usually not more than two weeks. But, um, uh, and the posted date for our credentials deadline is available online. Now, don't rest on that as as uh, an out. Um, we really hope, and it helps our process to have a completed application on these particular dates. Um, so do work towards that goal and save yourself plenty of time by starting early as you are now in learning about the process and what you need to do. So after you press submit, um, when you're applying through one of our application plans, what happens? Um, so after we gather all of your materials, um, we then do a first read of your application by your territory manager. So these are people that is, are assigned to you by your high school. So not where you live, but where you go to high school. And we are very familiar with the areas and the high schools. We are the people that are traveling. So you might see some of us out at your high schools. Um, and we really get that, we really understand your high school really looking into that school profile that we mentioned earlier. And that's when we're taking those one sentence notes on all the different aspects of your application. We then present it in a committee, which Beth Ann mentioned earlier, her and I have been lucky enough to be on committee for a few years together, um, where we all pull up the application and really dive in and have multiple perspectives on your application, looking through different um, components before we then make a decision together. When you submit your application, there's a few day lag, but you do gain access to something that we call the SPIDER portal. Most schools nowadays have an online tracking system for your application, which makes it very nice. I wish they had this back when I applied to college, um, but all the items that we mentioned earlier, don't feel like you have to memorize that list because after you press submit, you'll get that checklist on your SPIDER portal and it updates as we receive the different items with a cute little green check mark um, so that you can make sure all of your items are in for your application to be reviewed. That's also where you can submit any supplemental items that you might have for us, such as a resume or any note that you want us to have. Um, and then that's ultimately where your decision will be released. So that's where um, we'll send you kind of a cryptic email saying, check your spider portal in the next few days. Um, and then that's when we'll be releasing decisions. You can log into your spider portal and then that's where your decision will be released. Definitely make sure after you gain access to your spider portal to check your spider portal, make sure all of your items are in. We will try to reach out to you if we are missing items, but it really is upon you to check and make sure that we have all of the required documents for your application to be submitted and to be fully reviewed. Um, so we will email you. So make sure that you're looking through those emails, check your spam folder. I know sometimes, especially with Gmail, sometimes our emails get sent to spam. So definitely be checking all of the folders once you press submit to any college um, throughout your process. And when in doubt, reach out to us. That is why we are here. That's why we are called admission counselors because we're here to help counsel you through this process. We don't want it to be a stressful, overwhelming process. We really want you to feel this seamless process and be able to be excited about hopefully coming to Richmond or whatever school you end up at. But we really are here to help you through all the process. So please feel free to reach out at any moment. Um, and the next slide, we have our general application. Um, email address, as well as um, in the chat, we will throw, or in the Q&A, we will throw in before we leave today where you can find your territory manager. So you'll just click the link and you can type in your high school and get to be an email from your territory manager. By signing up tonight, you're also now on our mailing list. So especially seniors, be on the lookout for some emails and a lot of them do come from your territory manager. So if you press reply, a lot of them will come straight to your territory manager. So it makes it super easy to reach out. Um, I will also note, I know we have a lot of international students in the room. We do have an additional email inbox that is specific for international students, and that will have you reach one of our international admission counselors. Um, and so I will ask one of my colleagues on the back end of the scene here to drop that into the chat, but you can also go to our international admission webpage, which has that very readily listed. Um, and we are very happy to speak with you. We know that this is a slightly different process when you're applying outside the United States. Um, so if you fall into uh, that category today, um, just know that we are accustomed to working with credentials outside the world um, and we are happy to be a resource and a support to you. All right, so we have a little bit of time. I'm actually gonna, um, I think, stop sharing the screen here um, so that you can, um, 
see our faces. And uh, we would love to just take a, a peek at the chat and see if there are um, outstanding questions that we did not get a chance to answer. Um, and I will give a shout out and a thanks to our admission counselor colleagues who have been behind the scenes typing away at answers um, as we have gone through today. Um, so I'm going to maybe start Lauren, with this question about, um, I think there's a lot of questions about decision plans and what is most advantageous. We get this question a lot at this time of year. How can I improve my chances of admission? What will give me the absolute best shot of admission? And I know you're not going to like the answer because it's quite simple. Put together a strong and thoughtful application and meet the deadline. There is not a magic formula that we are trying to withhold. There is not a uh, specific criteria that is going to automatically equate to a stellar Richmond student. We are very fortunate to have the difficult scenario of having many more talented and amazing individuals applying to the University of Richmond than we will ultimately have seats for in the class. So our work is cut out for us and we take that very seriously, um, that this is an honor and a privilege to be able to read applications. We know that we're asking you to be very vulnerable. Um, and so um, that is something that we, we definitely um, try to take uh, into account. Um, now, the only application plan that is going to carry a slightly higher acceptance rate is either early decision one or early decision two. By the numbers, close to 40% of our class is historically in what we typically aim to enroll through the combination of both of those application plans. Now here's my tough love speech, and that is that early decision is not the right fit for everyone. And if your motive to apply early decision is simply to game the process and try to get the higher acceptance rate, you have not applied for the right reasons. Um, you really need to confidently say that Richmond is where I see myself socially. Richmond is where I can find an academic major that I feel comfortable pursuing. Um, and lastly, because the big unknown of early decision is you're not going to know if you're the recipient of a merit scholarship. You may not know your final uh, financial aid package at the time that you are committing to attend. And so uh, you do need to make sure that you are ready to make that investment in the University of Richmond, regardless of what happens on that front. And if you can say socially, academically, and financially, I'm sign me up, I'm ready to go, that is the correct time to apply early decision. So that is the only one of our plans that carries a slightly um, higher acceptance rate or small advantage because it is students telling us again, this is really thoughtfully where I see myself. Um, so I guess, again, a little bit of tough love, but I always like to be very upfront and candid about that um, to be able to make sure it is clear. All right. You want about a deadline to submit supplement supplementary material. So that's what Beth Ann was mentioning earlier. It's about a two week ish um, time frame. It's all listed out by application plan, the exact deadline on our website. Um, but yeah, we give you a little bit of wiggle room because we know tracking down your teachers or your counselor to submit your transcript is all not going to happen exactly on November 1st. Um, so as long as your application is in, we do give you that little bit of wiggle room, but try and get on that um, to get them in as close to the deadline as possible. But the exact credential deadlines um, for each application plan are on our website. Um, a few questions about merit scholarships specifically, um, and both in timing as well as what do I need to do to be considered. Again, just the admission application is all we need to be able to have you be considered for scholarship. Now, here is the difference, and I know we've got, again, a, a broad audience across the world joining us tonight. If you are a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, the University of Richmond practices what is called a need-blind admission process. That means that of the very many factors of consideration that we have gone through describing tonight, one of the things that we are not taking into account is your ability to finance a University of Richmond education as a factor that will influence our decision making. If you are an international student who does not have U.S. citizenship who is joining us this evening, the policy is slightly different. We practice, in that case, what is called need-aware admission. And that is because you are not eligible for federal dollars to support your education. 
Um, what that means is we are considering what you are able to put towards your university education as a factor in decision making. And there is one additional component we ask you to submit as an international student, and that is a certification of financial responsibility. That's you basically letting us know what you're able to contribute to your education across your four years so that we know if we um, had the financial support to accept you into our class. Um, the shared policy in common for both of these groups is that we want to meet 100% and we guarantee to meet 100% percent of whatever the difference is between what your family is able to financially contribute and what it actually costs to attend. So whether you're a domestic student or an international student, if we accept you into our class, that is a shared uh, promise. But those are the slightly different policies between need-blind admission and need-aware admission that apply. Merit scholarship is not based on um, all of this. So meet the deadline. Um, December 1st, that's what you want to make sure you're, you're doing. Um, and again, put together a strong application. Um, that's what we have to submit FAFSA to be considered for. You do not need to submit FAFSA to be considered for merit scholarship. That is correct. Um, and you will find out if you are the recipient of a presidential scholarship, which is again, the one third tuition scholarship we mentioned, um, you would find out about that particular opportunity within your admission letter. Um, when you find out your admission decision. Um, our Richmond Scholars Program, um, that works on a slightly different timeline. So often you may not know, especially in our early application rounds, so early decision one or early action, um, whether you have necessarily progressed for consideration for the Richmond Scholars Program. You might have an admission decision before you have that information on hand. Um, that usually happens after the new year. Um, so just be aware that that's the difference between those two opportunities. So I see one while we're on the topic of merit aid um, about a rolling basis, is it better to submit earlier for merit aid? So no, um, as long as it's in by December 1st at Richmond, we don't have rolling admission. So um, both for admission or for merit aid. So as long it could be December 1st on the dot um, and um, be awarded. Um, so no, it doesn't behoove you to submit it any earlier. And I do want to create a, a clarifying factor along the lines of rolling admission. We do not have rolling admission at Richmond. Um, and so our entry points for a first year student would just be in the autumn. Um, and that is the term you would be applying for. If you are applying as a transfer student and you have um, completed our required volume of coursework at your home institution, um, then there may be the possibility for you to apply as a spring entry student. But for first year students, that is not a pathway that we offer, only fall entry. Um, I'd love to actually jump into this question about um, resources to be able to get to know campus. And Lauren, maybe you can jump in on this too yeah. as someone who works closely with a lot of our students. Yeah. Um, so uh, we know that it's really difficult sometimes, um, whether you're an international student or you might you know, live across the country from our campus and it's difficult to be able to actually come in person to explore what we offer. Um, a few opportunities that I would point you to, um, one of them being the opportunity to speak directly with one of our current students through a one-on-one, -on -one, usually 15 to 20 minute chat. Um, if you're not aware of our mascot, we are the spiders. You see it in Lauren's backdrop here. <laughs> Um, and we call them spider chats. Um, those are available for uh, registration on our admission website and they are virtual. Um, so that's a really great way to get that firsthand perspective. We also have the ability for you to contact a current student um, through our website and you can even filter by um, region of the world or the country, by academic interest, by extracurricular involvement to really narrow in on someone who might have a really great perspective to share that's aligned with your own interests as well. And then last but not least, aside from coming to events like this, which we're glad that you've joined us tonight, um, we do have our virtual campus tour. Um, and so that's a great way to get that 360 panoramic view of campus um, and really kind of envision what it would be like to walk around um, our very beautiful college campus. Um, and I think that's those wonderful. are all resources I would point you to, to be able to um, continue your learning about the University of Richmond. Anything I missed, Lauren? Did you say virtual information session? I did not. That's a great. Okay. There's also a virtual information session that runs twice a week that you can register for um, as well. So um, a lot of great information about Richmond. It's by one of our admission interns. Um, so you can join that. Awesome. Um, 
Let's see. We're, we've got plenty of questions. Thank you so much um, for asking all of these. We're just trying to figure out where to go next. Yeah. Um, let's see. So really quick and easy question. Um, will this be recorded? Yes, we are actually recording this session. Um, and so um, it will be posted on our admission YouTube channel. Um, if you just search you are admission, um, we are the uh, there are a few colleges that share the name you are, but you are admission um, is where you want to go. And we will have this available for viewing probably by the end of the week. Um, but check back with us if mm -hmm. you cannot find it. There's also a lot of really great video content produced by our students that just show uh, mm -hmm. student life. So that's maybe one other opportunity yeah. um, that you might want to engage with in that space. Um, let's see. So to what extent does Richmond take into account the rigor of your school? So that is why we have territory managers because we become very familiar with our schools, um, with those school profiles that we receive. It is upon the territory manager, their responsibility to be very familiar with the school profile so that when we are presenting in committee, um, we're able to really speak to the rigor of the school. It also helps to have a lot of veterans in our office who um, have been in committee and reading for a very long time so that they know the types of schools that you're going to. And then again, we're just looking at you within the context of your own high school, the classes that are offered to you um, and the rigor of your school. So we are very familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Um, another question, is the resume required or optional? So the activities portion of the common application has the ability for you to put 10 activities that you have been involved in. We would encourage using that space to list a few things. At the very least, you don't need to use all 10, but if you're thinking about a formatted separate additional resume, it is not required. Um, we really do feel confident that we can receive the information we need to about your involvement and where you've dedicated your time just through the established space on the application itself. So no pressure to send that um, for sure. Um, there is a question as well about the arts specifically and whether there is a supplemental process um, that might be available for um, students who either play an instrument or dance or act, um, there is uh, the ability for you to submit a supplement um, that is specific to the arts. There are also specific requirements for format um, that we would like to receive that within. And that is available on our admission website. If you do, I always recommend just do a quick Google search, University of Richmond Arts Supplement, and you are going to find the information that you need all like to submit, uh, see submitted. And if you are saying, you know, this is not something that I want to have included in my application, or it's not something I feel is absolutely critical for you to understand that I've been involved in the arts um, throughout my high school experience, then you do not have to send it our way. If you are considering potentially majoring in one of those disciplines, and you really want the faculty to review that directly, that would be the time that you might um, want to consider an arts supplement two questions that are kind of similar about um, if they don't have a counselor. Um, so one is geared more towards international and then one is just if your school doesn't have counselors. If you just have someone at your school, so it can be a school official, so maybe someone who knows you in a formal capacity or it could be a teacher, just someone who is able to speak to your academic ability is what we require one letter for. Um, but then as Bethany mentioned, you can submit one or two additional letters from people who can really speak to you and your um, academic ability, your story, who you are as a person, but it doesn't have to be a college counselor if your school does not. That's a great point. And if you are international, I'm answering most of these questions because I am one of our international admission counselors. Um, so uh, also note that if your school does not have a U.S. counseling um, arm, uh, there is a free resource out there called Education USA. And these are counseling centers in countries throughout the world that are specifically focused on U.S. advising. You can find your center online. You are welcome to email and contact them. And that can be a point person that you can use as well um, as a trusted resource. Again, Education USA is the name of that. Um, 
This is a, a quick question. I think that's worth answering aloud. Um, do you have any type of policy about how many students you will accept from a specific school or specific state? Um, no, uh, we are looking for qualified students, no matter where they may be. We do not have quotas for specific states. Um, we do not have, you know, limitations on we can only accept X number of students from this particular school. Um, ultimately, because of our student body size, it does shake out to be a fairly um, diverse class um, with students coming from all different um, locations and types of educational experiences as well. Um, so um, no, we do not have like a target in mind for specific things that we need to adhere to. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. being a private institution, we don't have like an obligation to the state, whereas some um, public institutions, especially in Virginia, like two thirds of your student body have to come from that particular state. Um, since we're private, we don't have any of those stipulations. So yeah, the best and most qualified. Um, okay. All right, maybe we end on, it I sounds like, like we've gotten through a lot of these, but this is maybe yeah. a, a fun one for us to end on. What is yeah. the kind of student who is most successful at the University of Richmond? Lauren, would you like to kick us off or would you like me to? Yeah, so I think the students that are most successful at Richmond are students who are very passionate and very supportive. Um, so I work closely with our interns in our office and our tour guides, and so I hear them talk to each other a lot and just kind of listen, eavesdrop in. Um, and our students at Richmond are interested in so many different things. Um, so I don't, can't remember if we mentioned earlier, but about two thirds of our students have more than a major. So multiple areas of study. And I think that speaks volumes to these students that we have on our campus. Um, they're involved in a lot of different extracurriculars. They just have a lot of passions and interests. So I think being really passionate about something is important. Um, and then being very supportive. Our campus is one that is a little bit smaller with 3,200 students, but we are super supportive of one another, whether it's going to another student's acapella performance or going to see their research symposium, um, really taking the time and the effort to support one another and build each other up. And I think being a highly selective school filled with students who are super passionate, you could think that it could be a little bit cut through, but that is not the case at Richmond at all. Our students just want to see each other succeed. And so I think it's a really special place. Awesome. Um, I would say the type of student who doesn't fit in at the University of Richmond would be one who wants to simply go to class, pick something up to go from the dining hall and lock themselves in the room for the rest of the day. Some days maybe that's what you do, but by and large, our students really thrive on being busy. They really thrive on community. They're seeking out a residential campus experience. Um, and so I think a student who will fit right in is someone who is absolutely a hard worker, but someone who really thrives on community um, for all the reasons that Lauren was sharing as well. Uh, so I think that is the type of student who we find to really um, buy into what Richmond offers uh, as an experience. Now, if again, you'd like to continue your learning beyond our time together today, thank you again for all of your wonderful questions. Um, we would absolutely encourage you to either come to campus and see us. We love visitors or attend one of those virtual information sessions that Lauren was speaking to. I'm starting to see some questions about things like research and the student experience. That's a fantastic space to be able to ask those questions. Um, once more, we will be posting this on our admission YouTube channel. Um, so if you'd like to refer back to the content that we shared with you today, certainly feel free to engage in that space. And of course, let us know either by finding your regional admission officer or by contacting our general inbox at admission at richmond.edu if there are any questions that we did not get the chance to answer today. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time and your attention. We appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about how we do things here at the University of Richmond. Hope you found it helpful and we wish you a good rest of your day or night, depending on where again in the world you are joining us from and good luck to you in your application process. Thank you all so much.